Chapter 13 As Dick went up the hill, he saw on the porch a spot of blue with an expanse of white beside it Mrs. Osborne in blue gingham, with a dozen hospital shirts that she was basting, ready for machine work. Suddenly there was a commotion, a frightened fluttering and squawking among the fowls in the side yard. Mother hens were warning their young that a chicken hawk was near. It had alighted in a tall locust tree, ready to pounce on some defenseless creature. Mrs. Osborne rose quickly, but unhurriedly, went into the house, and reappeared in the door with an old shotgun. As the bird poised for its downward dive, she winged it with a quick, sure shot. It dropped in the midst of the young things that were to have been its prey. Whew! That was a fine shot, Cousin Polly. Dick said admiringly, a hawk on the wing. I am glad to get the rascal, Mrs. Osborne said quietly. It has been raiding my poultry yard, and I was afraid it would get some of Mayo's pigeons. Where's Cousin Mayo? Dick asked, beginning to feel embarrassed as soon as he got over the thrill of the hawk shooting. Mrs. Osborne always made the boys feel clumsy and untidy and ill at ease. She was as different as possible from her dark, rugged, merry husband. Everything about her was neat and prim and small. She had a pretty little mouth, a little thin nose, little round blue eyes. Her fair glossy hair was plaited and coiled around her small, well-shaped head. Mayo has gone away, she answered. He may not come back tonight. Will you come in? Is there any message? No. No, thank you. And Dick made his escape. After all, he was glad Cousin Mayo was not at home, and he had not yielded to the impulse to tell the tale, which would have involved the telling of his own secret. He would watch the mine himself and find out if Mr. Smith and the two Negroes were trying to get its treasure. At the mill Dick saw the mail hack coming from Redville, and ran to get a ride. Jim Walthall, the driver, had news to tell. Three of them drafted niggers from Cherylburg County, run away from Camp Lee, deserted, by Jinx, Bill and Martin Toole from the lower end of the county and Caesar Gabe. They trace them to a freight train, and folks think maybe they come back here. I've got printed descriptions of them, to put up at the post office. The sheriff's on the search for them. Oh, I hope he'll find them, said Dick. He won't declare Jim. Those fellows wouldn't think of coming back here where everybody knows them. Why, they'd be caught right away. No, they'd gone to Richmond or New York, a city somewhere. When Dick got home Ann and Patsy were sitting in the swing in the yard. There's Dick. He's been secreting again, laughed Ann. I've just come from Larkland, Dick said shortly. And and at the mill I met they stopped swinging, and interrupted him before he could tell his news about the deserter. Did you see him? Patsy asked excitedly. Isn't it Kuno Cleist? Demanded Anne. I just saw Cousin Polly. Cousin Mayo's gone away. With Kuno Cleist, that German friend of his, the one he was in Mexico with. He was at Larkland. We saw him. And now Cousin Mayo's gone away with him and Patsy pinched Anne's arm. Mr. Jake Andrews was coming up the walk was, in fact, close to them before anyone saw him. On being told that Mr. Osborne was not at home, he turned and went away. I'm sure he heard me, and I'm awful sorry Anne said. It's a secret, Dick, for Cousin Mayo didn't. And then she told the whole story. Oh, well, what you said didn't make any difference, said Dick. Jake doesn't know what you were talking about. He wouldn't care if he did. And then he told them about the deserters. Anne and Patsy and Dick would have been dismayed if they could have followed Jake Andrews. He left the village and went straight along the Redville Road to the old Tolliver place. He gave a shrill whistle, and a minute later Mr. Smith sauntered out of the back door toward a clump of trees on a hillock. Andrews cut across the field and joined him on the wooded eminence where they were secure from observation. It's like you said, Smitty declared Andrews. Them dogs gone old aristocrats need watching. Black Mayo Osborne knows a German spy Smith started violently friends with him, staying in his house. Them gals saw him, that German he was with down in Mexico. Mr. Smith had regained his composure. He's there, you say. Gone now. That mischievous Dick Osborne was at Larkland after the gals was there. The man's gone away, and Black Mayo with him.
Mr. Smith knit his brows. To have known this before, what the devil he looked at Jake Andrews and adjusted his face and words. You have acted with the wisdom and patriotism in coming to me. It is service to government, and there are rewards, much money. But it is of the most importance that you keep cemetery stillness. He paused and his lips writhed and set themselves in a hard, cruel line. Then he said, We shall not be surprised now to hear of the outrages. But what happens, keep you silence except to me. The week went by quietly, in spite of Mr. Smith's prediction. Black Mayo came home, without a word about his guest or his journey and went here and there more busily than ever with his pigeons for trial flights. And then things did happen. The home guard at Redville had received orders months before to patrol the high bridge over which troops and supplies were constantly passing on their way to Camp Lee, or to Norfolk. Day and night the youths in khaki paced to and fro, with guns on their shoulders. And then what a thrill of horror it sent through the community. One of the bridge guards was killed. The shot came from the heart of a black, rainy night that hid the the criminal. He went free, ready to strike again where? Whom? At any minute. Was it one of the deserters? Probably not. Their one aim would be to lay low and avoid arrest, and probably they were far away. The community had been thoroughly searched without finding them. A few days after the bridge guard was killed, Sweet William came running from the mill in great distress. It's poisoned, mother, sobbed the little fellow. There's glass in it, the flower we were saving for the Belgians. What's the matter, dear? What is it, Patsy? exclaimed Mrs. Osborne. It's so, mother cried Patsy. Oh, mother. Cousin Giles found glass in a lot of flour. Someone got in and put glass there, to poison it, in our mill, our own mill here at Larkland. The finding of glass in flour at Larkland Mill was the one subject of conversation in the village that Saturday night. And on Sunday a day that in the little Presbyterian town seemed stiller and sweeter than other days people stood in troubled groups at the church door, discussing the matter. The minister even referred to it in his prayer not directly. That would have been regarded as irreverent but, with the veiled illusions considered more acceptable to the almighty, glass and flour at the mill, Larkland Mill. The people resented it with a vehemence that would have puzzled outsiders. Larkland Mill was not merely a mill. It was one of the oldest, most honored, most loyal members of the community. As the quaint inscription on its wall said, this mill was finished building by Hugh Giles Osborne his men, 8 June, in year of our Lord 1764, ye third year of his gracious majesty King George III. On its oaken beams were marks of the fire set to it by Tarleton's men, because that Hugh Giles Osborne's sons were fighting side by side with Washington. Nearly a century later, soldiers in blue marching from Georgia had taken toll of its stores. And then Colonel Osborne, coming back in defeat to poverty, had laid aside his Confederate uniform and become a miller, as his son was today. Larkland Mill had served the whole community in peace and war, and it was loved with a personal feeling. Had not the children even had a birthday party in its honor at Happy Acres, not so long ago, for it to deal out poison was like a father's G. For it to deal out poison was like a father's giving it to his children. Not that the mill was to blame. Of course not. Who could have taken advantage of it and put glass in its flower? No one could even guess. Mr. Spotswood had not seen any suspicious person around, only the usual frequenters of the mill, which included all the men of the community, white and black. The Avildor, a stranger and an outsider of course, must have come in the shielding twilight or the covering night. Nothing easier. The mill was near the highway, the door stood wide open all day, and shutting them at night was a mere matter of form. There were a dozen easy ways of ingress, day after day passed and brought no trace of the criminals. There was a growing feeling of uneasiness throughout the community. Whispers went about, tales circulated among the village loafers, the source and foundation of which no one could give, but which were repeated, at first doubtingly. But they were told over and over again, and gained credence with each repetition, until they were believed like gospel truth. These tales were a 
about Black Mayo and his guest. Dick was in the back room of Mr. Blair's store one morning, picking over apples to pay for some candles. He was daydreaming about the mine, and at first was only conscious of voices in the front room without really hearing the conversation. But presently he heard Mrs. Blair ask excitedly, Agnes, have you heard these shameful tales about Black Mayo? Shameful tales about Cousin Mayo. Dick listened now. What do you mean? Asked Mrs. Wilson. People are saying, oh Will, tell her, I am too furious to talk. Jake Andrews is accusing Mayo of being disloyal, a suspicious character that ought to be watched, arrested. Mayo watched, arrested, Mayo. Jake Andrews accuses him. And pray, who is Jake Andrews? A common fellow from the upper end of the county, who schemed to keep his sons out of the draft. This Andrews and some other fellows went to Larkland and actually asked Mayo about a guest of his in what his business was. Mayo refused to tell, and when Andrews persisted, why, he settled the matter settled the matter how? Asked Mrs. Wilson. Knocked him down, of course. That was all right. The idea of Andrews catechizing him. It was infernally insolent. I wonder he dared do it said Mrs. Blair. Oh, the fellow is a justice of the peace or a deputy sheriff. Or some sort of little officer conceded Mr. Blair. It seems that Andrews has been sneaking around, watching Mayo, and he's found out. He claims that Mayo has been harboring an enemy alien, a German I don't believe anyone at all has been there, said Mrs. Blair. So the thing has gone on. But Mr. Blair paused and frowned. But what? Asked Mrs. Wilson. Why doesn't Mayo explain? He exploded. I gave him the opportunity, deuce take it. I was so sure he would make it all right that I brought up the subject yesterday. When there was a crowd here in the office, waiting for the mail. But instead of saying where he went or who his guest was I'm a Dutchman. If he didn't walk out of the office without a word. And that makes it worse than if you had not given him the chance to explain. Said Mrs. Wilson. Of course. But I was so sure of him said Mr. Blair. Then he asked impatiently. Why doesn't he tell where he goes and why? Because he doesn't want to said Mrs. Blair. He thinks people haven't any right to ask. And so he won't tell. But he ought to tell said Mr. Blair. Of course it's all right. We know that. But some people doggone it. He said vehemently. I wish I had knocked Andrews down when he came drawing his suspicions to me. I will beat the scoundrel to a pulp if he comes in my store with another question. Of course Mayo's all right. Of course, said his wife, more vehemently than absolute certainty required. I, I wonder why what he wouldn't tell you. Whatever Black Mayo does is right, Mrs. Wilson said serenely. He has some good reason for silence. Of course, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Blair said, avoiding her eyes and each others. I know about it Dick thought, with a thrill of pride. It is all right? It was Kuno Cleist. Kuno Cleist. He remembered with dismay Mr. Blair's words, a German, an alien enemy he's concealing. Why, that was what Kuno Cleist was. And for his cousin Mayo to hide him, was not all right in the eyes of the law, but a crime. They'll never find out from me said Dick to himself, gritting his teeth. I'll be hanged and drawn and quartered, like men in the days of Bruce, before I'll tell anything to get Cousin Mayo in trouble. Black Mayo feels oh, we know how he feels said Mrs. Wilson, but in these times there are things we owe to ourselves and to others. Mayo ought to tell about his perfectly proper journeys and perfectly proper guest, and I am going to ask him. Agnes, I know, I never thought I would interfere would ask a question about anyone's private affairs she said but i can't help it i am going to do it i must black mayo suspected of treason black mayo that we've known and loved all our lives why it is as if someone should say my ruth was a thief Mrs. Wilson was not one to postpone a disagreeable duty. She put on her bonnet and gloves and started at once to Larkland. It was a path familiar to her childish feet. How often she, like her own child, had roamed about this dear, quiet country playing in the mill, roaming about Larkland, fishing in tinkling water. Miranda and Giles Spotswood, and Mayo, Polly Spencer, 
Beaverly Wilson, and Red and Black Mayo Osborne, had been her comrades, Black Mayo, the leader in all their sports, was the chum of Beaverly Wilson, whom she married the very June that Black Mayo married Polly Spencer. The friendship of early days had lasted and deepened with the years. It was stronger than the tactful habit of never asking personal questions. She found Polly Osborne on the porch, busy, as usual, with Red Cross sewing. She dropped her work and set a comfortable chair in a pleasant corner of the porch, while she called greetings to the approaching visitor. How good of you to brave the heat and come to see me, she said. Here is a fan. Take off your bonnet. I'll get you a glass of raspberry vinegar. It is so refreshing on a warm day. Mrs. Wilson put a protesting hand on her arm. Don't, Holly. I can't sit down. Not now. Where is Mayo? I want to see him about something important. Mayo. I reckon he's in the garden. He has some pigeons there in the old summer house. I'll find him and tell him you want to see him. No, please, Polly. Let me go there and speak to him. Then I will come back and see you. Certainly. Just as you wish, said Mrs. Osborne. You know the way all the ways here as well as I do. Mrs. Wilson went along the flagstones across the yard, through the garden gate down the boxwood bordered walk. She turned across the huge old garden to the summer house embored in microphylla and Cherokee roses, with their dark foliage, starred with creamy blossoms. She heard a merry voice whistling Dixie, the only tune that Black Mayo had ever mastered. There he was in overalls, hard at work putting up boxes for nests. How do you do, Mayo? She said, speaking before he saw her. He dropped his hammer and caught both of her hands in his. I wished you on me, he said gleefully. I was thinking so hard about the rainy days when we children used to play here. I found a box with some of our dominoes in that closet, when I was clearing it out to make a place to keep feed for my pigeons. Don't you remember I remember everything, Mayo? She interrupted, with her lovely clear eyes meeting his from the mud pie days to the generous sending of your books, when mine were burned. And because I do, I have come to ask you some questions. Who was your guest three weeks ago? Where did you go? On what business? When you left home with him, he looked her straight in the eyes. You ask Agnes he hesitated and she took up his words. I ask Mayo, about your private affairs her voice did not falter, but her cheeks flamed because people are saying things about you that I we want you to disprove. Oh, he said sharply. Then he dropped his voice and his eyes and answered. I, I can't do it Agnes, Mayo. She exclaimed. There was a little silence. Then she said, Oh, Mayo. In a tone that implored him to answer, he looked away. If you were asking me for yourself, Agnes, he said, I, I ought not, but I might probably I should tell you. I do not ask for myself, she said. I trust you utterly. If there were one little doubt in the thought of my heart, I could not come to you with this question. A question I must leave unanswered, he said with a wry smile. Oh, no mayo, she said. You know I don't wish to force your confidence, but it seems to me that when people ask how dare they ask, we have no right to refuse to prove our loyalty. Are they asking Giles Spotswood or Will Blair to prove theirs? He inquired a little bitterly. They say you can guess what they say, Mayo. She could not make herself give words to their suspicions. Oh, yes. He answered quickly. I know. They've been questioning me about Kuno Kleist, my friend in Mexico. Being a German, he was probably a Prussian. Being a Prussian, he was probably sent by the Kaiser to incite the Mexicans against the United States. Being a German and a Prussian and the Kaiser's emissary, he probably perverted me. Good reasoning. And they want to know about my comings and goings. My old absent days rise up and damn me with my dear stay at home county people. And I've had a guest and I've taken a few little trips. And I haven't put a bulletin in the post office to say who and where and why. And so they want me to explain. I can't explain. His voice grew harsh and he laughed mirthlessly. Let them roll their doubts and suspicions like sweet morsels under their tongues. Then his voice softened. It was like you, Agnes 
to come to me in the spirit of our old loyal friendship, and I thank you. She put out her hand to stop him, turning away her head. She could not give him at that minute the sight of her grieved face. Don't, Mayo, she said unsteadily. Not thanks between us. You, you understand why I came. I, I am sorry she walked slowly back across the fair, fragrant garden, taking time to get control of herself. Before she went through the gate, and along the flagged walk and around the house corner, there was Polly on the porch, still busy with her sewing. Mrs. Wilson compelled herself to sit down and chat a few minutes about gardens and fowls and Red Cross work. Then she said goodbye and started home. Near the mill she met Dick Osborne, and he looked at her with eager eyes. Then his face fell. Cousin Mayo had not told her. Dick was sure of that as soon as he saw her face. Why not? It must be a tremendous secret if Cousin Mayo couldn't tell Cousin Agnes and she asking him too. He remembered uneasily the conversation that Jake Andrews had overheard. He was sorry that fellow had happened to come along just then. He must tell Anne and Patsy to keep their lips glued up. Alas, it was too late now for caution. The secret was out. 